before you are going to fly today. You have made your pre-flight check, warm-up, and run-up. Today you're going up to 9,000 feet where you'll practice a few turns, dives, and stalls. You'll also investigate three and two engine flight characteristics. You are now waiting clearance to take off. Five nine three, this is Tower. You are cleared for immediate takeoff. Over. Tower from five nine three, Roger. You release the brakes, advance the throttles to the stop. Your ship roars down the runway, gathering speed. At 90 miles per hour, you exert a slight back pressure on the controls to relieve the load on the nose wheel. At 115 miles per hour, your ship leaves the ground, and now you're airborne. You hold the nose down to pick up speed and signal the co-pilot to raise the gear. Your gear is fully retracted and your speed is climbing above the 135 miles per hour mark. Now you've attained a safe altitude, so you signal for flaps up. You reduce power to 45 and a half inches manifold pressure at 2550 revolutions per minute and synchronize the propeller. Synchronization distributes the load equally on all four engines and eliminates the beat note. Your co-pilot synchronizes the propellers by tachometers and is still able to help you with the ship if necessary. Later, you get more exact synchronization by blending the propeller shadows like this. When you get each pair of propellers adjusted, you beat synchronize the pairs by ear. Operate your switches in pairs, one and two together, or three and four together. If you're flying at night and tachometer synchronization doesn't satisfy you, synchronize visually by using the Aldis light to make propeller shadows. Loaded to 55,000 pounds, your V-24 is climbing 1,000 feet a minute at 150 miles per hour. If your load exceeds this weight, you must reduce the rate of climb and increase speed, otherwise your ship will mush along or stall. During the climb and at frequent intervals thereafter, check your instrument. Your rate of climb is now 1,000 feet per minute Air speed, 150 miles per hour. Manifold pressure, 45 and a half inches at 2,550 revolutions per minute. Oil pressure, approximately 84 pounds. Fuel pressure, 15 pounds per square inch. Oil temperature is under 80 degrees centigrade and cylinder head temperature under 210 degrees centigrade. The readings on the four engines may vary slightly but they will be approximately correct. The important thing to remember is that the reading should be well within the allowable range. Cylinder head temperature, for instance, should never go over 260 degrees centigrade. That is the maximum. If the temperature goes higher than that, ease off on the climb. You'll get a little more speed, which should cool the engine. If this doesn't work, open the cowl flap slightly. If the temperature continues to rise, try changing the mixture control from auto-rich to full-rich. If that doesn't work, ease off on the power. And if it still rises, you'd better return to your base. While above normal readings are not trouble themselves, they do indicate possible trouble. The logical thing is to check and find out what's wrong. There's one best way to fly these ships, and that's the right way. But don't worry, your instruments check okay, so relax a bit until you reach altitude.
Your altitude is slightly over 9,000 feet, but you want to cruise at 9,000. You go on up to 9,500 so you can go over the hump. You need that extra 500 feet so you can approach your cruising altitude from above. You ease forward on the wheel, your tail comes up, and you're in a shallow dive. Reduce power. You're over the hump and on the step where liftover drag is high. Your airspeed has jumped from 150 to 185 miles per hour. Now at 9,000 feet, you level off. The tail is high and you're in the groove. You set power for cruising. Manifold pressure, 31 inches at 1,900 revolutions per minute. While you're setting your power, your co-pilot resynchronizes the propeller. Place mixture controls in auto lean. Turn booster pumps off. Close cowl flaps to minimum opening. For every degree of cowl flap opening, Cruising speed is reduced approximately eight tenths of a mile per hour. Cowl flaps opened more than one third may cause tail buffeting and a loss in lift due to the spoiled airflow. High air speed cools better than open cowl flaps, so it's a good idea to keep the flaps closed unless otherwise indicated. Incidentally, if you hadn't gone over the hump, you'd be in trouble by now. Take a look at this. The pilot is climbing his ship. He levels off at 9,000 feet. Notice the attitude of the ship? Tail dragging. The ship is sluggish to the control, struggling. He's mushing along, trying to gain speed under reduced power. Pretty quick, the engines will start to heat up. The pilot will open the cowl flap. That will set up a turbulence around the tail surfaces, and then he's in trouble. Give your ship a chance. Do it this way. Approach your cruising level from above. Notice the way that tail comes up? Now you're on the step and in the crew. What about fuel consumption? Remember that the most miles per gallon are not always the least gallons per hour. Use enough power to reach the most economical speed. When you're on a cruise, Check the cruise control chart to obtain figures for operating speed under various conditions. After setting the ship to cruise, make a check to be certain that flaps and gear are fully retracted. Turrets should be pointing toward the tail. Waist gun hatches and deflectors should be closed. You want to reduce drag to a minimum. This is really a flying battleship. It is big and fast and easy to handle. But remember, this ship was not designed for rolls, loops, spins, or inverted flight. If you'll always keep that in mind when banking or maneuvering, you'll not deliberately exceed safe limits. You're still in the groove cruising at 9,000 feet. Oil temperature, 75 degrees centigrade. Cylinder head temperature, 210 degrees centigrade. Oil pressure, 90 pounds per square inch, and fuel pressure, 15 pounds. Your engines are still within the allowable range, and that's exactly the way you want them. If an instrument does go over the maximum, don't get excited. The manufacturer of this ship provided for plenty of reserve beyond the maximum, but a stitch in time saves nine, so it's best to do your troubleshooting before the maximum is reached. How about your turbo supercharger? Remember, the last two inches of manifold pressure should be made. So with turbos off, retard throttles two inches until the manifold pressure drops to 29 inches. Then set the turbo superchargers to maintain 31 inches of manifold pressure. Keep 
your turbos engaged at all times for one inch boost. This keeps the blades moving and prevents warping due to rapid temperature change. It also keeps the oil circulating for turbo lubrication and control valve operation. In high altitudes where turbo superchargers are needed to maintain manifold pressure, first open the throttles to the stop. Then use the turbo superchargers for the needed gain. About 23,000 feet, pulling 45 and a half inches manifold pressure at 2,550 revolutions per minute, the manifold pressure must be reduced one and one half inches for every 1,000 feet over 23,000. This reduction is necessary to keep the speed of the turbo under its limit of 21,300 revolutions per minute. Also, in operating at high altitudes or in cold climates when icing conditions exist, intercoolers may be closed to prevent icing at the carburetor. At all other times, intercoolers must be open. When intercoolers are closed, however, care must be taken not to exceed maximum cylinder head temperature limit. Well, you came up here for maneuvers, so how about getting started on a few banks and turns? This ship banks easily and safely up to 60 degrees but you must remember load factors while banking. In a 30 degree bank, notice how smoothly and easily the ship handles. Your altitude remains constant as you make left and right turns. just as safe in a 60 degree bank, but in this position your load factors are twice as severe as in level flight. It turns easily and smoothly. Altitude remains constant during the turn. Now here's what the turn looks like from the inside. Watch that artificial horizon. You'll notice, if you're not careful, you're apt to lose some altitude. But an increase in power and back pressure on the wheel will correct that. If you are forced to dive, remember your diving limits. These limits vary according to the gross weight of your ship. For instance, 355 miles per hour is the absolute maximum speed loaded to 41,000 pounds. If your ship is loaded to 56,000 pounds, your top speed must not exceed 275 miles per hour. To start your dive, trim your ship slightly, nose heavy, and down you go. Your airspeed builds up rapidly, 220, 230, 240, 250 miles per hour back gently on the controls and recover smoothly with the minimum of strain. How about another one of those dives? 
They're important, so you want to be certain you keep on the safe side. Control should be handled as slowly and as smoothly as possible. Abrupt movement should be avoided. Your wing loading builds up rapidly on a ship of this size, so it's wise to keep your diving speed to its minimum. That gives you a wider margin of safety in the event you run through turbulent air. you came out of that dive like an extra. Now, reduce speed to 150 miles an hour for a little maneuvering with flaps. Notice that the ship is in normal level flight position. Extend flaps 10 degrees. In normal position with 10 degree flaps, the tail rises slightly, the lift is greater, and the ship is more responsive to the controls. Your ship turns easily and smoothly. Altitude remains constant during these turns. Extend the flaps another 10 degrees. The attitude of the ship has changed noticeably. The tail is higher. Do a little flying this way and see how the ship handles. With flaps extended to 40 degrees, your ship handles smoothly and is completely maneuverable. You can make turns at lower speed because your stalling speed has been greatly reduced. However, if your speed exceeds 150 miles per hour, flaps must be fully retracted. You've seen how she handles with flaps. Now let's see how she handles in a stall. With power off, put her nose above the horizon until she slows down to the stall and falls like this, straight down. Let the nose go down just far enough to pick up speed. Increase power and ease back gently on the wheel until you're in level flight. That was an easy one. From the inside, that stall looks like this. You're cruising at 9,000 feet. Power off. Lift the nose above the horizon and the airspeed begins to drop.
down it goes to 125. Your ship shakes and falls. You increase power and ease back gently in the wheels. The nose comes up and you're in level flight again. Stalling speeds vary several miles per hour depending upon weight distribution, outside air temperatures, and upon factors which you cannot safely judge. Now here's a stall with flaps and gear down. With power off, you lift the nose. The speed drops until the nose falls straight down. But as speed is regained, you level out again. Here's how that stall looks from the inside. Power off. Pull the nose up, and the airspeed goes down and down and down. At 93 miles per hour, the controls gradually go limp. She shakes and falls. You increase the power and recover from the dive. This ship has no vicious flight characteristics. The stall is always forewarned by a violent shaking. In a normal stall, the ship remains level of its own accord unless you encounter rough air. Then it may fall to one side or the other, like this. You recover with power, rudders, and elevators only. Ailerons remain in neutral. In a stall of this type, the use of ailerons would tend to increase or accentuate the stall. Stalling speed may vary, so in the event you have an unexpected stall, push forward on the wheel and increase power. Keep your dive as shallow as possible and ease back slowly on the wheel as soon as you pick up speed. Then, determine the cause of the stall and make the necessary adjustments. You lose altitude rapidly in a stall, so in practice stalls, you understand why it's a good idea to be a long ways up. So much for stalls. How about taking that flying battleship back up to working altitude for a little three and two engine maneuver? First, you go up to 9,500 feet and over the hump. You level off at 9,000 feet. In this demonstration, you'll feather these two engines, first two, then one. Two is the inboard engine. In preparation for feathering engine number two, you increase the power on the remaining engine. Set the props on one, three, and four in higher RPM. Push the throttles on engines number one, three, and four to the stop. Increase power until you have 32 inches of manifold pressure at 2200 revolutions per minute. Before feathering the prop, pull the turbo on engine number two. Retard the throttle and place the mixture control in idle cutoff. Then reach overhead, raise the transparent guard, and press the number two quick feathering button. The propeller comes to full feather and stops revolving. Now a little rudder tab to compensate for torque, about three and a half degrees for an inboard engine. Close the cowl flap. With one engine dead, you still have excellent control. In an emergency, you can reverse the feathering procedure by first pressing the quick feathering button, then setting the mixture control to idle cutoff, then increase power. Loaded lightly and using only 65% of the power in three live engines, it's no trick to maintain a speed of 165 miles per hour in level flight. As a matter of fact, B-24s have made flights as high as 18,000 feet, loaded to 55,000 pounds with three engines by using additional power. When making deliberate turns with three engines, it is advisable to turn away from the dead engine, that is, keep the live engines on the inside of the turn. Otherwise, the thrust of the live engines, combined with the bank of the plane, 
might cause a slipping or stalling condition. No doubt you're wondering what to do in the event there's no chance of making a right turn. Well, like most rules, there's an exception to this one, but it's recommended only in case. In a turn of this kind, keep the turn as shallow as possible. But you can see for yourself that with a little care, you'll have no trouble with left turns. Engineering really thought of safety factors when this ship was designed. And if you don't know what we mean, try this on your B-24. Pull the turbo on engine number one. Retard the throttle. Move the mixture control number one to idle cutoff. Press the number one quick feathering button. And you find yourself cruising along with two dead engines. Now you'll need about eight and a half degrees of rudder tap to compensate for torque. Close towel flap. Before going further, here's an item to jot down in your notebook for future reference. Your vacuum pumps are attached to engines number one and two. When these two engines are dead, the gyro flight instrument and the deicers will not operate. If engine number three fails, the brakes, bomb doors, flaps, and landing gear will not operate. So in order to have a hydraulic system, you must start the electric auxiliary hydraulic pump and open the crossover valve. Try a right turn with only two engines and see what happens. There she goes in a smooth, shallow turn. And how about left turn? With two dead engines on the low side and the running engines acting to increase the angle of bank, it's mighty easy to get out of control. But if there's no other direction in which to turn, and you must, then you must. But it's best to keep on the safe side and creep around this turn. Better be on your toes. You don't have much control on this turn. A little bump or updraft would put you out of... Wait a second, what's this? Looks like trouble from here. And trouble it is. You're in a stall. And down goes your left wing. But you're thinking fast, so power off. You make your recovery as in a normal stall. Here's what that turn looks like from the inside. Your speed is 150 miles per hour, and your altitude is 9,000 feet. You're turning toward the left. Your ship wants to bank, so you give it right aileron to hold the wing up. You give it more, and more, and more. But she stalls. You retard the throttles, and down she goes into a long dive. Your recovery is the same as for your practice stalls, and you're in level flight again. To unfeather the propeller on engine number two, set the governor to minimum RPM position, press the number two quick feathering button, and hold until the engine turns up approximately 1,000 RPM. Then you move the mixture control out of idle cutoff, adjust your throttle to proper manifold pressure for engine warm-up. When warm-up is completed, set prop to the desired pitch and set the throttle to the desired pressure. To unfeather the propeller on engine number one, set the governor to minimum RPM position, press the quick feathering button. Uh-oh, but you don't do it that way because your prop unfeathers and feathers again. You'll have to hold that button down longer. That still isn't long enough. Your prop unfeathers and feathers again, unless you hold that button down until your engine turns up at least 1,000 revolutions per minute. Now you're back on all four engines again, so you can sit back and look at the scenery until you catch your breath. Anyway, school is just about out for the day. You've had a chance to fly this ship, and if you remember the fundamental facts that you've learned, you'll find that the B-24 is the fastest, hardest hitting, and safest four-engine bomber that can be given you by the Air Forces of the United States of America.